Welcome back to American Beef Ranch. Today we're going to talk about the part of the soil test that your agronomist doesn't know how to fix or actually doesn't want you to fix. Hey everybody, welcome back to American Beef Ranch. I just want to take one second to thank you guys for watching this video. I greatly appreciate it. Your support has been incredible. So today I want to talk about the part of a soil test that a lot of people miss. A lot of people miss its importance and they miss the incredible role that that part of the soil test plays in the success for your crop. Now look, we've talked about it before. There's two different ways that you can think about crops. You can go soil to plant, you can go plant to plant, or you can do a combination of both. We typically like a combination of both. Now those guys will look at them soil tests sometimes and They'll look at it, they'll talk about it. Well, you got this, you don't have this, you don't have this. We need to mix it in there, but there's no rhyme or reason and there, there's no real guarantee that that's gonna get to the crop. And then those plant guys will come in and they'll be like, hey, we'll see a deficiency in a tissue test or a sap test and we'll go ahead and we'll add those nutrients, full your feed them onto the crop, onto the plant and get a, usually a good response out of it. But sometimes they still miss the boat because there's some underlying factors, some underlying limiting factors that are always important to pay attention to. So I'm gonna go ahead and put a soil test up on this screen. If you have some vigilant eyes, you may be able to tell whose soil test this is. You obviously see we have pH, we have uh, you know, our macronutrients, we have our base saturations, we have our micronutrients, we have our nitrate nitrogen. And usually people look at this, uh, they'll look at the pH, they'll look at the salt, they'll look at the micronutrients and be like, oh hey, you're low in any of those micronutrients, you need to add those. It's great advice. You should definitely have those micronutrients because they can be key, little keys to unlock different systems in the soil. And then they'll say, oh, you got high pH, we need to do something about that. They'll add something or say they need to add something. Usually sulfur is what's recommended to lower pH. Uh, it's not a bad recommendation other than sulfur, it doesn't really fix the problem. So there, there's that. But then we get to the most important part. In my mind, the two most important parts of a soil test are the cation exchange capacity, which you see here, and the base saturation percentage located right next door to it on this soil test. Now, for a real rough explanation, the cation exchange capacity, that number determines basically the ability of the soil to hold on to nutrients. And so if that number's lower, Typically, you, the soil has a lower ability to hold on to nutrients, whereas if that number is higher, it has a higher ability to hold on to nutrients. Here in this area, and that soil test is from silt loamy soils, and we do have sandy soils in this area. Sandy soils, you will usually see a lower CEC, down to about five or so, and then clay soils, you'll see a higher CEC up to the 30s and 40s. Now, notice, take out the top field because the top field is uh, fallow. If you look at all these fields together, you'll notice that one is significantly lower than the other. It's a 14. That cat ion exchange capacity is lower. If you have something similar to this where you have a set of cat ion exchange capacities of about the same and then you have one lower and your fertilizer dealer prescribes the same program for those fields, you're wasting your money. The reason being and, and this is from personal experience. That field there has been applied, double applied and triple applied compared to the other fields to try to get it whipped into shape. And yet it still has less nutrients and more lower levels of nutrients than my other fields do, even though they've been applied at least two thirds, if not three quarters less the amount that that one little 25 acre field has. And if I would have known that the field doesn't even have the ability to hold on to those dry nutrients, it would make sense to not apply those extra dry nutrients. If your CEC is really low, it's pretty important that you feed the plant pretty heavily, but also often throughout the season. If you just hit it one time in the, at the beginning, you're gonna lose a lot of those nutrients and you're gonna run out of steam at the end of the growing season, where if you spread those nutrients out throughout the year, you're gonna see a lot better response on those low CEC soils. Now let's move into the next part, which is the base saturation percent. Now the base saturation in my mind is the most overlooked part of this soil test. 
people will look at it sometimes and they'll say, oh man, you guys got a lot of salt. We need to try to keep that number down. Or you got too much potassium. We need to keep that number down between, you know, uh, three and 6%, which is, you know, a good, good idea. But what they've forgotten is that 80% of your base saturation is made up of two nutrients, calcium and magnesium. And those two are tied together with a marriage tighter than you could ever understand. Okay. So on our typical silt loamy clay soils, we want 68% base saturation of calcium and 12% base saturation of magnesium. That equals 80%. We never want those two to be above 80% combined. As you see in this soil test, we have a major problem. We have way too much magnesium. But how do we identify that without even using a soil test? Well, there's two ways. One, if a field is super sticky, like if it gets wet and it sticks to your boots really bad, it sticks to everything, that usually shows that you have elevated magnesium levels. Also, higher pH soils typically have elevated magnesium levels. And on the contrary, the calcium side of things is most often where weed pressure is really high, or you see weeds like with big tap roots like thistle, or you see morning glory, or you see common ragweed. There is an issue there where the soil does not have enough calcium to make sure that those weeds stay at bay because weeds don't like available calcium. So if you have available calcium, there's enough calcium in your base saturation, a lot of times weed pressure is much lower. But if you have high magnesium, it's almost guaranteed that you have a problem with compaction. See, like I said before, magnesium is sticky. It's what causes the soil to stick together and hold together. And if you can imagine for a minute, the part of the soil that holds onto nutrients, the clay colloids and the humus colloids are basically plate-like structures. And it, for a simple explanation, we like those structures to be in a certain orientation, let's say horizontally and vertically. And we like them to build on top of each other. And that gives us the good balance between the minerals, the air and the water, which is our 50% minerals, 25% air and 25% water in good healthy soil. Now with compaction and excess magnesium, here's what happens. So when you usually have those good orientations with compaction, those orientations fold on top of each other and then they're stuck together because of excess magnesium so they can't break up. And that's what creates a compaction layer in your soil. Now, if you want to correct this issue, there's several different ways, but the easiest is tillage. Tillage would be your friend to help break up that compaction layer. Now, the base, balancing of the base saturation is absolutely key to have a high yielding, high profitable crops because uh, the better the best sa base saturation is, the better you're going to be able to reduce those nutrient inputs and get response out of the crop. So if you guys want to learn how to break up that compaction layer and what the steps to take to do that are, we'll see you in the next video.